Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co, P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of the Charlie Chats Footy Podcast with me, Charlie Casson. Thank you once again for all tuning in, much appreciated. Hope you enjoyed last week's episode. This is episode 4 with Lewis Reeves. Lewis and I went to drama school together. We weren't actually there at the same time, he graduated a few years before me, but we managed to become mates due to the uh, Royal Welsh Alumni Football Team, which is our drama school. Um, where we played up front together for a couple of years now, um, got a little enlarged partnership going on. It seems to be quite effective so far. So yeah, hopefully me and Lewis can continue that. You may know Lewis from ITV's series Unforgotten, where he plays DC Jake Collier. He's also been in stuff on Netflix, such as Crazy Head, and he's got a couple of TV shows coming out. And he's also got his own movie coming out called Lola, a short film coming out soon. So yeah, stay tuned for that. But what most of you are going to know him from if you're FIFA fans, is Lewis plays Gareth Walker in The Journey in FIFA 17 and FIFA 18. Now, Lewis and I speak about his first football in memories, his love for Doncaster Rovers. He tells us about a very special and unbelievable game he went to at Brentford from the perspective of the away end, which is amazing. When you hear it, the hairs in your neck will stand up. We chat about Lewis playing the most hated character ever on a football game in Gareth Walker, which I just touched on. And lastly, you know the drill by now, we find out what footballer Lewis Reeves would play on the big screen in a movie about their life. Hope you enjoy it. Take care. Make sure you follow on all the socials and subscribe and all that. And um, yeah, enjoy. This is episode four of Charlie Chats Footy with Lewis Reeves. Talk to me about, let's go right back to the beginning. Talk to me about growing up. Was football, football a big part of your childhood? Yeah, I mean, that, I think my, I can remember being taken to the Bellevue Stadium, where, which was Doncaster Rovers' old stadium when I was like five, standing on the, the terraces with my granddad. And the, ever since then, it's just like, just been injected in me. And that was quite tough because Doncaster Rovers were even, you know, probably lower down in the football division then and they got they have no press or whatever and everyone sort of from my area supported Leeds. Um uh, that was which was which was sort of quite tough. Uh and I ever since then I've sort of been up against it with them really. So why why like you said about Leeds there, you mentioned Leeds. you you're from Yorkshire then, yeah? Yeah. So what you got You've got South Yorkshire, you've got Sheffield United, Wednesday, Barnsley, yeah. Leeds just around the corner as well. Why Doncaster? You can't beat that um that first time of seeing live football. Like it could have been like it felt like the Santiago Bernabeu stepping out onto the terraces. Do you know what I mean? Even though it was like what, three, four thousand people, but I'd never seen so many people together at at one time and everyone was singing like the same songs and there was like mates from my you know, class who were there and who were there with their dads. And there's just sort of nothing that can re- replicate that sort of like enigmatic sort of atmosphere. And as soon as you get a taste of it, that's it, in it, you're done. You can't like sort of change allegiance or or try and replicate it somewhere else. I, I was in and that, and that was it, which was pretty bad for me because Leeds were pretty good at the time. Wednesday were in and out of the Premier League and so were Sheffield United. And, uh, Doncaster Rovers were dog shit, but but I, but I love them. Have we just have you just compared to Bellevue to the Bernabeu? Sorry, we got a touch on that. Um, yeah, but I'm not the only person to make that comparison. <laughs> when did you leave there? Then was it about 2005 or six? Was it? But yeah, what well, I mean, keep mode still feels fairly new to me, but it's probably like 15, 20 years old now. I had this problem with Barnet 
when we were at Underhill, you know, it was all terraced and yeah. it was all standing and it, it had about, you know, five, 6,000 capacity. And then we moved to um, a ground where, you know, it's all seated. We can't fill it. Mm. I mean, what was, it like? what was the transition like to the keep mo? You've gone from like terraces and sort of 10,000 capacity to a 15,000 all seater. Yeah. Hosting Elton John. So, you know, um, it was, I mean, I think, it's such a hard one isn't it because like the romantic notion of like being on the terraces all together that sort of like working class feel that to get you you're as close to the you know the footballers as you can be but it just doesn't work in the you know the modern day the way you're trying to compete but the time that the um the keep mode came about um Doncaster were doing really well we had like a really really great team we had like Brian Stock Billy Sharp um J. Manuel Thomas was on loan, J- Jamie Coppinger. And we were really, you know, we were in the championship and we were sort of on the on the fringes of getting a, a playoff spot. So it kind of felt, it all felt really positive. And we had like Sean O'Driscoll in our, who was managing us. And it, it all felt really good and positive and like it was the right chain, you know, the right time to do it. And it all felt like progress. But, um, you know, now when you see like 8,000 people there or it's not quite making attendance, you do, you know, you do miss the good old days. But I think you always sort of romanticise the past. Mm, for sure. So where's where's the Liverpool connection in all of this then? Um, well, okay. So my Uncle Barry, the, the reason I fell in love with Liverpool was a very similar reason why, you know, my granddad took me to see Doncaster Rovers and my Uncle Barry took me to see... Um, a Liverpool game at Anfield because he was a Liverpool fan um, and there was always like a Liverpool connection sorry can you hear the baby screaming in the background there it's fine mate so, it gives it a bit of effect yeah sure just the fans are going mad um, we always had like a weird Liverpool connection because my, my mum used to cut Kevin Keegan's mum's hair and the claim to fame in our family is that Kevin Keegan once made my mum a cup of tea and he used to actually work under my granddad at Pegler's factory. So there's like this weird Liverpool connection in uh, Doncaster. But anyway, that aside, uh, if you can get over that, my mum's not actually responsible for Kevin Keegan's terrible barnet. But if you can put all that aside, uh, my Uncle Barry, he was just Liverpool sport. He took me when I was probably about eight and like, you know, going from the Bellevue and then well, I just remember being, being walked out and it would cop end and just like being just... Uh, like just so emotional like almost like quite scared like it felt like you know like troops on a battlefield yeah and and since then I've sort of been bitten by two teams so like when when the topic of like who do you support comes up you go like oh Liverpool and, and Doncaster people are like oh what the fuck you can't have two teams you can't have two teams which I totally agree with but at the same time when you fall in love that's it so Let's say Doncaster gets the FA Cup final mm. against Liverpool. Mm. I mean, stranger things have happened. Where <laughs> what, what what side are you sitting on? Who are you who are you rooting for? I think I, I was born in Doncaster, so I think I'd probably go good for Donny. Also, um, it'd be it would be a much bigger occasion for Doncaster as oh well. Oh god, it'd be I'm I'm kind of hoping for it. Do you know what I mean? I'm wishing it, but um I don't think we're in any danger of that. Do you know what? If I've missed football so much. Oh my god! Yeah, we had the same thing because I, 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 I don't know if many people know this. One well, of my close friends will, but I'm the same as you. I, I grew up on United. I still look out for United, but you sort of, you know, just fall out of love with it slightly. But we had, we had United away in 2005 in the Carling Cup. We, our goalie got sent off after 90 seconds. Oh my god! I think I remember that. Yeah, he came rushing out and just picked it up and the ref just like looked at him, gave him a red and then they scored from the free kick. So we won nil down with 10 men after two minutes. I mean, well, we scored, we scored. That's all we wanted. We scored, we, we lost 4-1. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. So what's, what's, your, what's your first football memory? It don't have to be about, don't necessarily have to be about Liverpool or Donny, but like mm. looking back, what is your first football memory? My, my, I think my first football memory was what was my was my first game with uh with my granddad and it 
it was just the worst game of football I think I've probably ever seen to date. Playing Yeovil, and to this day, I've got like this weird hatred for Yeovil. Yeovil's a lovely club. There's, I've, there's, they've not done anything wrong. But just because I think that game was pissing it down, it was crap. It was a great start. Do you know what I, mean? I obviously, you know, liked it enough that I kept coming back. I think the players were just kicking the shit out of each other. The ball wasn't going anywhere. And um, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was just it was just crap from, from start to finish. Oh, actually, a better story than that um, is we... I can't remember what game it was, but Ian Snodden, who used to play for Everton, was our manager for Doncaster at the time. And he was, like, swearing his head off. I think we were, like, a couple of goals down. And he was really going into the players, like, effing and blinding. Um, and my granddad um, leant over um, <laughs> and said, literally said these words. He went, Ian, do you mind with the language? I've got my fucking grandson here. And my granddad wasn't <laughs> even being ironic. That was just him, man. And the whole place just erupted. And Ian started sort of waved and sort of said sorry. And I could just remember being like, I don't, I don't think, you know, he sort of came away and he seemed really <laughs> pleased with himself. But I was like, I don't think we won that one, Grandad. So what league, what, what league was that then when you would have been playing oh, the Oval? conference then. Oh, you was down there. You was yeah, right down yeah, there, were you? Early, I think early, early 2000, we nearly went down. It was, it was, it was really bad. And then we sort of, we just got back to back promotions for like five or six years got the new stadium and then there's this real this real buzz and this real build of like uh of what the club was becoming but i think we just hit you know if you look at the championship now every single team in the championship has been in the premier league in the last you know 10 mm. 15 years we just i just don't think we can compete really until you know unless some multi-millionaire comes in would have want that I don't, I don't think so, but it is. It feels like we're very much a middle tier club. Do you know what I mean? We can hope maybe some seasons winning League One, and then we battle in the Championship. There is, there is no other way. If you want to be getting top flight football, you you need that sort of that other investment to come in. It would be really exciting. I think it'd be brilliant. Um, so you, oh God, fuck! I don't know. I don't know. I think. It's a tough one because then it if you if you get that investment and you and you sort of go up the leads and leagues and you're in the prem and you've got a load of money behind you, it sort of then just takes away what made you fall in love with it in the first yeah, place. It's just, that is true. It, it's a tough one. John Ryan, our chairman, did such a great job, uh, um, and he could take he, he took the club you know only so far. He looked over that whole period with Sean O'Driscoll and the you know the Keep Mount Stadium. Um, and to an element, you know, the old days are over. So I, I, it's, it's not something I wouldn't turn down. But I think, you know, the club's run really, really well. But I think it can only go so far with its current fan base. Do you know what I mean? If you look around Yorkshire and you've got United, Wednesday, um, Bradford, you know, clubs arguably a lot bigger. And you're going to need a dramatic change in order to... to um, to push on really and improve and attract those, mm. you know, those other players. Now, just talking about, we'll touch on this because, you know, talking about Doncaster going up the leagues and the closest you have been to the Prem has been the championship. Yeah. Now, I actually, I I think this actually gets forgotten about because Roy Dini done the exact yeah. same thing, more or less. Um, Brentford v Doncaster, final day of the season, you were in that yeah. away end, right? Tell us. I mean, I've heard I've heard interviews from from Brian Flynn's perspective of it, Coppinger's perspective of it. The most but, important perspective of all, Lewis Reeses. I mean, tell us what happened. It was so. The, the, what was at stakes was if we won, we, we would win the championship and, and go up. If we drew, um, we'd come second and gain automatic promotion. So yeah, that was. And we were playing Brentford, and now it was. It, it was just as equally important for them because they were in the playoffs and if they won, they would gain automatic promotion. They wouldn't be able to win the league, but they would go um, uh, into, go in, in second. 
which would have put you in the playoffs and Brentford and Bournemouth yeah, automatically. Yeah, and there was just an atmosphere around the club at the time. Like we'd sort of teetered off. We, we'd been flying, but the last six games coming to the, you know, the real you know, business end of the season, we just teetered off and I think we were knackered. So there was this element, there was like this unsaid thing, this atmosphere of we've got to do it today because if we don't do it, we're not going to go through on the playoffs. I don't know why, but that, that was just the atmosphere. So everyone was absolutely buzzing. There was no way, we were well over capacity in that ground. It was it was absolutely kicking off. It was brilliant. Um, And the game at Brentford, where I think we had a few good chances, but I think they were by far the better team. It was nil-nil. Oh, and it was nail-biting. All... <sighs> I can't remember what the minute was when they got awarded the penalty. I think it was something as dramatic as like the 90th minute. This is why it's better than the Leicester one, because I think that was the semi-final playoff. Now, this was the last the last moment of the season, d- defined everything. And I can't remember who Brentford's captain was at the time, but he was the penalty taker. And I think it was Trossard, who was on loan from Fulham, pushes him off. He's like, right, right I'm having this. And he'd had a blinding game and I was just like, oh God, this is just, it was sickening. It was the worst thing. I thought, shit, they're going to score. They're going to go through. We're going into playoffs. We can't do it. And Billy Painter had gone out to the halfway line um, and he was kneeling down and he was pray- praying. Uh, and Brian Flynn said to him famously, he was like, what are you doing, Billy? And he was like, oh, I'm, I'm praying. Uh, anyway, Trotter steps up, smashes it against the crossbar and the sound around that, that it was like we'd scored because we knew we were going up. Um, maybe we, we weren't going to win the championship, but we were going up. It comes out, it's an absolute medley in the box and it clears all the way out to Painter. So his prayers obviously worked. And he was, I, I don't think he'll shy away from the fact he was a pretty big lad for a footballer. So, so hang on two seconds. So Painter... Yeah. I've seen, I've watched the video endless times. Painter wasn't there from a managerial choice of stay there tact- for a tactical thing if it gets cleared. He was there because yeah, he was praying. It was that, I mean, it was literally like the last kick um, of the season, right? So he's just praying that they don't score. So the ball comes all the way out to him. Flares go off all around me. The whole place is jumping. Uh, it takes a great touch. And then all of a sudden we're like, hang on a minute. They're coming towards us. They're they're in the the in Brentford's half. Uh, the keeper comes um, charging out, and lo and behold, the legend that is Jamie Coppinger is there. And it'd have been a normal tapping for for anyone else, but the stakes. I can't tell you the adrenaline. The stakes were so high that cops had to take a touch, and it was like the whole world was holding you know the breath. He takes one touch, and with the last kick of that game of the last kick of the season, he scores the goal to make us win the championship. We just went absolutely fucking mental. And I've never, I'll never get a high. It was just, you couldn't, you couldn't write it. Like, it was just so perfect. For, from all of a sudden being third in, you know, the 92nd minute, we go to second, then you go to first. There's, there's got to, have, that's got to have been the quickest progression you know, in you know, for a final league sort of in history, I reckon it was um, it was just unreal. I just went out absolutely smashed. I I think it is better because the Deeney one, they got to Wembley, but they lost to Palace in the final, so nothing actually ever amounted to from that yeah, goal. Yeah. Whereas you, you won the league. There's a famous bit of uh, commentary in the Deeney goal. So Deeney scores and you hear the commentator go, Deeney! And then he runs off and you can hear the commentator. He goes, it almost mirrors the final day. And he's talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. Um, the Brentford Donny game. Yeah. I couldn't even imagine being in that it way. Was, it was honestly the best. And I've been lucky enough to go to some really good games, but that was, that that really was the, you know, just one of the best games of my life. And I don't think... Is that the best feeling you've had at a, at a football match or watching a yeah, football game? hands down. Although... Last season, um, the Barcelona Champions League match wasn't too dissimilar because Charlotte was she was six seven months pregnant. I just finished the play, and I actually gave up a ticket to go 
because Charlotte wasn't very well. Um, so we were watching the game. So there was, you know, the gutting nature of knowing that I'd missed that match and then watching it unfold, it was just... That, 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 that comes a very close second, I reckon. That was bonkers, is that? Because the week before, or the night before, or was the week before, Spurs had done it in Amsterdam yeah, as well. Right, yeah, against uh, Ajax. Ajax, yeah. yeah. That, that was... That that was that was pretty that was pretty special, but yeah, but Brent Brentford away will be you know forever up there. It will take some beating. It goes down as a, you know people watch that for years yeah. and years. I even got Kyle Bennett's football boot from that match. I think he only made like four appearances for us that season, but I've still got it with the champagne cork that I uh, bought a bottle with um, the champagne corks in his boot, which is like a size children's five. Kyle Bennett's boot. There's a little bit of trivia. Take pride and place on my on my work table at home. You mentioned Coppinger. He scored that goal, right? He's he's done what plus five hundred games for you. Yeah, he's our all capped um, player of all time. He's he's phenomenal. He's thirty eight. He's still he's still and he's still going. He's still one of our best players. I just I hope I hope he never retires. I hope the club always keeps hold of him. He's, he's a phenomenal example. He's quality. I think I remember because obviously when you went you went to the championship after you won the league at Brentford, and then you went straight back down under Dickoff. Yeah. Um, and then I think you had a season in League One, and then you went into League Two, and you got relegated from League One when Barnet when we won the conference. And I remember going to that League Two season, watching Barnet Doncaster, and I remember texting you because it was at the Hive, and we you beat us two 0 and I just remember texting you going. God, that Coppinger, he's still got it, hasn't he? He's got, he's got quite an interesting story, Coppinger, because he was part of the, because he, he played for Newcastle, he was part of that Sir Bobby Robson team. The reason he's, he is the player he is, I mean, he, at the time, he says in his own words that he just didn't feel like it was anything special, and you know, he, in, you know, all his family were like, you know, cops, I can't believe that you're playing for Newcastle. What an honour! Every boy's dream, you know what I mean? But especially a lad from Newcastle to be playing for. Uh, Newcastle. I mean, there's no bigger honour, right? Um, but he just, there was something in him at the time um, that just, he, did, he didn't it didn't appeal to him. Uh, and he dropped down the leagues uh, and I think he was sort of losing his way a bit. And then I think it was, it was he got to such a point, he was like, oh no, this is what I want to do with my life. And then it was like a real Roy of the Rovers return. Um, and he, he found Doncaster and he's just been you know, he's just dragged us, you know, we've been through so much with him. He's a real, you know, he's he's our Stephen Gerrard um, and he's been a, a, an incredible servant to us. When we got relegated from the Championship first time round, when we were with Sean O'Driscoll, he went to Nottingham Forest for a season or two, but then he came, then he came back and he's, he's just, he is phenomenal. I love him. When are they getting the? Uh, when are they building the statue then outside the keep, mate? Mate, I can't believe it hasn't been done yet. It, that that definitely will happen. You know, so it's a matter of time. Yeah, it seems inevitable, doesn't it? I mean, plus five hundred games, sort of one club man by the by the forest trip, but yeah. And I th- I just I just hope he keeps going. He's just one of these players, you know, like sort of like gigs at the end of his towards the end of his career, just able to adapt his game so well. But what is so amazing about him? He's 38 and everyone calls him Chops because he's got a favourite move where he just cuts inside as a fake. And still, to this day, no one ever... You know it's coming, but no one ever picks him up. And you see, like, 18-year-old lads, you know, twice the pace, and he's cut inside him and he's gone. It's phenomenal. You're going to make me emotional, mate. Now, um, we got to... Uh, uh, like I said, at this podcast, I, you know, I want to get actors and creatives on, talk about... Footy. Yeah. I don't want to touch on. I don't want to touch on credits. You know that, that's boring. We we all know what people are up to and what they've what they're right. doing and stuff. However, we have to talk about FIFA. Right. Yeah, this is a one-off because it is FIFA, yeah. right? So, for those of you who don't know, Lewis is Gareth Walker on FIFA's The Journey. Um, now we. We've we've grown up with FIFA, right? We've all our generation grown up with FIFA. And when you get it, one of the first things you do, or well, one of the first things I do, is I try to create <laughs> a look like of myself, and I try to make him play like myself. Not very good, 
but I tried to make him play like myself, look myself, have the boots I'd have. And you never get it right. You can never get it right. Whether it's the nose, the ear, the eyes aren't the right shade or shape. It just doesn't work. And it just never really looks yeah. like you. So for you, for you to whack on the PS4, put in FIFA 18 or 17, and click on a mode and you are on it, you, it perfectly looks like you. I mean, surely that's surreal. Yeah, surreal, but I didn't realise how short I was. Until I saw <laughs> myself on that game. Uh, and you're next to like, whatever, like Rio Ferdinand or whatever. And you're like, oh, fucking hell, I'm a right short ass. I was like, they made me look like a hobbit. Have they adjusted that then? Have they adjusted the height? Because don't you go and, isn't it to like to actual size when, you, when you're filming um, it? I don't know what they've done, mate, but I'm going to say, yeah, they must have adjusted it because there's no way I'm that short. I'm at least 6'2". They gave you a bit of pace, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, I was pretty rapid. They got that right, yeah. I know you are. You're you're quick anyway. I mean, I played with you a few times. You are quick, but I mean, they've made you. Uh, they've made you even more rapid. Yeah, they, it it was such a surreal experience, even from like um, the audition. So it's made that like EA Sports is over in Vancouver in Canada, and they had the Canadians over, and the audition was like you know when you go to an audition, you have to sound like non disclosures. You know, if it's like for Disney or. 20th century fox they're really secretive about the scripts you don't know what you're going in for right um and i knew it was a game and it, it was something to do with football um and then i obviously did all right we did a couple of readings i sort of made them laugh and i think i was in for a different character possibly danny williams or or maybe even the hunter character i can't remember and then they're like, okay, yeah, cool. So we'll, um, we'll show you guys some footage of what, what we're thinking about doing. Um, and then they showed some of the footage. And I was like, that is, you know, I mean, you, can, you know what Pez is. You know what FIFA is. I was like, that is FIFA. And I just wouldn't let it go. Um, and they're like, okay, cool. Yeah, that's I was like, um, sorry, excuse me. Is, um, is this for FIFA? And they're like, um, <laughs> oh, we, we can't really say, but, um, you know, okay, we're in the locker room. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but. This is FIFA, in it? Yeah, yeah, all right, okay, cool. Just quickly, this is definitely FIFA, in it? And I think they were like, do you know what? This lad's a bit of a prick. He'd be a perfect Gareth Walker. And I think that's probably what got me the job. <laughs> so your, your, your persistence and annoyance of asking them what it is got you, I think got you the so, role? Yeah, I think so. I think they were like, he's kind of funny and a bit annoying. I've got to read, I've got to read you this, Lewis, okay. right? So obviously Gareth Walker is a, is a you know, he's yeah, a character. Yeah. And I hope you haven't seen this because because <laughs> I want your reaction to be like you know you've never right. heard it before. So I found this on the internet last night. Right, it's from a <laughs> it's from a forum called Cultured Vultures, and the headline is: "We have a new contender for the most hateable game character ever." Right, and the art, the little I've taken a little paragraph from the article, and it reads this: "Step forward, Gareth Walker, <laughs> Alex Hunter's supposed best friend in FIFA 17's journey mode. From the offset, Gareth is hard to love. Not only is he bumming lifts off his best mate's granddad, but he's also giving lip about it. This can be excused as nothing but youthful scallywaggery. Through a quick look." <laughs> <laughs> Though a quick look into his chipmunk eyes tell a far bigger story. He is a creation of pure evil, something that should not be released into this world with a, without a powerful spell to let him loose. And his haircut is shit. <laughs> I can take all that on the chin. I can take the chipmunk on the chin, the behaviour. What hurts is uh, that's my actual haircut. <laughs> Do you know what there was there was so much online and Twitter and that. Um that my mum my mum bless her. So you know, people would be like, Gareth Walker, you're a prick, you you snake, you twat and stuff like that. My mum would be like, Oi, Aaron at one, two, three, is not, he's a really nice lad. <laughs> and I'd have to tweet my mum being like, please, please can you stop defending me? Just <laughs> just leave it out. So what when you were when you were doing FIFA then, did you did you actually get to play football with any of the pros? Um, no, but they, I mean, going out there was... It, I thought you'd be, we'd be doing lots of um, 
sort of like simulated football stuff in the mocap suits. But it, it, I mean, they get, I think, the local team, which is Vancouver Whitecaps, they get in all those boys um, to sort of recreate all that sort of stuff. But g- going to EA Sports Vancouver was literally uh, the little kid in me's dream. It's exactly how you'd think. Like, there's big, like, training pictures there with the EA logo on in the middle. There's, like, indoor basketball courts. Um, they've got, like, a club shop, um, which they literally just said to uh, I me and uh, a few other actors were, like, you know, fill your boots, guys. And now, I'm not a gamer, but all they, got, they all got loads of games. Um, but there was, like, loads of, like, Adidas gear and stuff. I just had a load of that. It was literally... It was a, it was a, a foot. It was just a total dream, from from start to finish. It was a, I, I loved it. It was great. Yeah, I bet, mate. It's it's like for every football fan's dream and every gamer's dream, it's to be on FIFA. Do you yeah, know what I mean? in my it's head class. at the time, I was like, yeah, I've, I was pretending to be a professional footballer. Do you know what I mean? Um, and everyone was lush to work with. It was great. So, any player in the world, past or present. You can play them in a Hollywood blockbuster biopic of their life, yeah. right? All rivalries aside, forget about like your alliances to your clubs and stuff. Who, who are you playing? Who's, whose life story would you want to portray on the big screen? I've, I've watched the documentary on this guy recently, and I think it'd have to be, I'm going a bit left field. I'd go for someone like Stanley Matthews. He was like one of the most fittest footballers. Um, around and he played through through the like his career had like a 10 15 year gap i think from the age of like 35 until his late 40s because of the war and things like that um so i think i always think someone like him would be would be amazing he's got an incredibly inspiring story he was sort of like ahead of the game like how athletes are now like you have like ronaldo who's just like the peak of like physical fitness isn't he well, Stanley Matthews, his dad was uh, a boxer, so he knew all about nutrition um, and, and training. He trained two or three times a day, whereas other footballers of that time, you know, would would show up, they'd kick a ball about, but that, that'd be it. it. He was, you know, he'd run on the beach a few miles before before training every day, before going to play for, like, Blackpool and Preston, and he's, he's a real working-class hero. I think he's got a really, really... Uh, interesting story i think maybe him interesting i wasn't expecting I think it's that because i watched the documentary recently i think it's on like amazon or something but he's always uh it, that name's always been edged into my mind but probably because of people like my granddad and my uncle who sort of idolized him but he's sort of forgotten about because he's not a direct you know we, we didn't get to see him play as such but he's his story would be i think it, i've always thought it'd be an amazing film I think I'd go for someone like him. Him or Dean Windass. I used to get called Dean Windass at no. school. Were you a porker yeah, at school? I was a porker, yeah. And I used to play up front. So they used to call me Dean Windass or Emil Heskey. <laughs> that is amazing. But I preferred Windass just because I thought he was a bit more of a baller than Heskey. But he never made it in the England squad like Heskey did. Actually, that's being harsh on Heskey. Heskey, Heskey was decent. Heskey gets so much stick. But, I mean... Heskey and Owen, they were just f- formidable. I feel like Heskey and Owen like started off the little and large phenomenon they, they up were, front. They were the true combo. I mean, that whole Liverpool squad, that those those two as pairing, I think were probably one of the most underrated pairing that, that there was. We had them up top together as well in the 2002 we World did. Cup. And then we? Fab brought Heskey back. And that's probably what ruined it a bit. Do you remember Fabio Capello when he brought Heskey back for, what was it? Was it Brazil? Oh, no, South Africa, 2010. Oh, God, yeah. And he'd sort of had his day then. He'd had his day, but he was like, fuck it, it's it's a free holiday. Lewis, thank you very much, mate, for coming on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Mate, the pleasure was all mine. Anytime, mate, anytime. I loved it. Nice one. Rovers! (laughs) 